Our next guest is an amateur boxer turned minor league hockey player turned author. His book, Goon, the true story of an unlikely journey into minor league hockey, inspired the movie Goon with Sean William Scott. He was not only a policeman on the ice, he has also been a policeman off the ice in Massachusetts, as well as doing a bit of coaching. It is our pleasure to welcome to the 4000 and Counting podcast, Doug the Thug Smith. Doug, thanks for joining us, buddy. I appreciate it, boys. Yeah, welcome on. Hey, Doug, is that, is, is that nickname transferred over to your police career that they still call you Doug the Thug? Down no, down? thankfully that didn't follow me. That was just a hockey nickname that uh, a journalist had penned me uh, one night after a bench-clearing brawl. And, um, you know, it's good for sports. It's good for hockey but uh, it's certainly not good for uh, police work <laughs> or real life. <laughs> hey, Thug, how's it going? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Especially like, in your uniform as well, right in the early days, just guys shouting. I saw on uh, Elite Prospects, though, there was another nickname for you. It was the Hammer as well. Was there, where does that one come from? So, you know, right. I, I got I got a year, um, a season um, after playing in the East Coast Hockey League, and I got a season up in Canada. I was kind of trolling around. I didn't have a place to play. And a friend of mine who was a scout, he got me a, 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 onto a team up in Canada. And it was in New Brunswick, and it was an all-Canadian team. I was the only American. I was the only import. And it was a real tough fighting league. And, you know, he knew I wanted to do some fighting, so he got me into this league. And the, um, the announcer up there who did the games, for some reason, decided to nickname me Doug the Hammer. And I tried, to, I tried to tell him one night after, I said, you know, there's already a guy named the Hammer, and his name was Dave Schultz. He played for the Philadelphia Flyers back in the 70s and 80s. I don't want to be known as the Hammer. But this asshole kept calling me the Hammer, and it stuck <laughs> up there for the year. <laughs> yeah, because Dave Usually Schultz on is a legend. <laughs> Yeah. We go all the way back, all the way back to the very start of a playing career, where you started, why you started so young. Everybody's a young lad when they pull on the first pair of skates. But am I right in saying that you never pulled on a pair of skates to the age of 20? Yeah, you know, I, I really, I did put on skates when I was a kid, probably 10, 11, 12 years old, but it was only two or three times. I didn't like skating, so I never followed through. And it wasn't until I was almost 20 years old, I had been an amateur boxer all through high school. And I competed in our local tournaments like the New England Golden Gloves and, and stuff like that. And, um, and, and that was kind of what I was into. And, and a friend of mine who was a, a hockey player, he played high school, he played college. You know, he always had this kind of this crazy dream. You know, if, if Doug could ever learn how to skate and, and keep his balance long enough, he could maybe be like a minor league fighter because he's got some fighting background. And, and back when I played, which was like in the 1980s and the early 1990s, you know, Hockey, especially in the minor leagues, there was a lot of fighting all the time. It was a big thing to, you know, have two or three Good old days. on your team. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and that's kind of how it went down. You know, that, that's how it all started was just through my friend's dream. And, and he was the one that actually got me out in the ice. And, you know, we just started working towards it. And, and believe me, it was shit luck that everything fell into place like it did. So how did your amateur boxing career go? Because uh, I, we're, we're all boxing fans on this podcast. Well, any sort of action where someone's getting punched in the face we <laughs> we pretty much enjoy it but like as an right. amateur and, boxer any, how did you do any uh, kind of legitimized violence we're in <laughs> everyone likes a little violence right oh, but <laughs> uh it's when you're on the receiving end of the violence where you don't really like it <laughs> nevertheless um uh, you know what i enjoyed it my father was an amateur boxer he was an actually a uh, he was a sparring partner he was a paid sparring partner for a guy named paul pender who actually was the world champion middleweight champion back in the 50s and 60s so it was just something that I wanted to always do be a boxer and uh like I said I went into the New England Golden Gloves tournaments uh, a couple of times I made it to the finals but I lost in the finals so I never made it onto the national Golden Gloves level but you know I, I was still satisfied with what I did so how did you find the early transition into getting like you said you don't like skating but you can, you can throw hands. So how did you find the transition actually when you started to play hockey again? Did you, did you go right back and get a skating coach or was it a lot of self-taught stuff? It was a lot, it was a lot of self-taught stuff just to try to learn to keep my balance because, you know, at the time 
you know, I was six foot two, 250 pounds. And, you know, for, for having that type of body weight, balance was kind of tough. Um, but once I started thinking, and I know it's crazy to say, but once, you know, I was only like a year into skating and I started to really believe that maybe I could be a fighter for real in the minor leagues. And, and like you had just said, Nick, I, I decided to find myself a, a skating coach. And it was a guy that, you know, who was in my area and, you know, he had done it for a living and, and I worked with him and he'd have me coming out doing skating drills, stops and starts, crossovers with little kids, like kids that were eight, nine, 10 years old. I'm like 20 years old and I'm skating <laughs> with all these little kids. They're laughing at me while I'm falling down. It was <laughs> but, uh, but it had, to, it had to take place. I had to learn those basics to be able to get on the ice, just to be able to square off with someone. You can't look like a complete asshole. So you, you got to at least get some basics down. Where did you dip your toe and then what was the first team, the first sort of competitive game that you played? So I didn't play in my first real organized hockey game until I was 22. And that was just a local league in my area in the Boston, Massachusetts area. It was a summer league and it was like a pro-am league, like pros and amateurs play in it. And I got to skate with a lot of professional guys. And you know what? My whole angle for getting into this league was just to try to go after guys that were already noted tough guys. There was a lot of NHL fighters who skated in the summer league just to stay in shape. And, you know, guys like Chris Nyland and Knuckles. Yeah. yeah Knuckles Nyland. And, 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 oh, I yeah. bet you love this fucking guy that's been skating with the under tens coming out and challenging <laughs> into a fucking fist fight. With his... Seriously. I'm like coming off the bench, like ankle burning out to the, you know, face off circle, you know, asking Lyndon Byers to fight me, you know, from the Boston Bruins. Tough guy too. So, um, yeah. So, I mean, it was a great league for me. And, and that's actually where I got noticed get, by a scout. Did you get many, many tilts in? I only got a couple of tilts in, not with any NHL guys, but some other. I was going to say, not league. too many summer takers, right? <laughs> no, and I don't blame them. Listen, listen, they would have kicked my ass no matter what. And, and it's more of a risk for them. I mean, say they broke their hand. They got a lot to lose, something. eh? Yeah. For me, there's no chance. And, and I don't it's blame like, them. Oh, why, can't, why can't you start the season? Broke my hand in summer league. Who'd you fight? I don't know. Nobody. <laughs> uh, nobody. So you were so, saying uh, that you got scouted from that summer league. How did that come about then? Was that for the um, Thunderbolts? Yeah. So from that summer league, I, I got down into the East Coast Hockey League. And that was my first league. And I went to training camp and I got a couple of fights. But, you know, the coach was a really good guy. He was a former player. And he said, you know, Smitty, you're, I like you. You're a good guy. And I know what you want to do but you got to bring a little more. You got to be a little bit better of a skater. And I got some guys here. I know you fought two or three guys already in camp. I know this is going to sit well with you, but I'm going to keep those guys because they can play the game better. And I still know they're willing to fight. And just to fast forward about two months later, I get a call back from the same coach. He says, you know, those guys that I kept, they quit. They didn't want to fight. They got beat up a few times. They couldn't handle it. And they went home. And he said, do you still want a job here? And I said, of course I do. So I went down in like December and finished out the season. And uh, it, believe me, it was, a, it was a wild story. Yeah, one or two scraps down there. Go, though, going in your first 20, 28 did games. You, did you win the Rayleigh <laughs> Cup? Yeah. The Rayleigh Cup in your yeah, first season. We won the, yeah, we won the championship. And, uh, you know, it, it, was, it was quick for me. I probably played, I bet you I played all of 30 games. And I probably had 175 penalty minutes. They were all fights. And, 28 uh, and 179, according to Elite Prospects. Yeah. And, uh, not an apple, though. You got an assist. Yeah. I think that hit me off the ass one night and I got an assist on it. <laughs> I couldn't but, even get uh, that. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. So I, I really earned the respect of my teammates. The fans love me, of course, because now I'm just out there to fight every single night. And they're all, it was down south in North Carolina. They're all redneck hillbillies and they don't want to see blood anyway. So they don't care if you win or lose the game, they want to see someone fight. Love that. Where, where was it up when you got called up to the AHL? Was that where you fought Frankie the Animal by Lewis? It is. Yeah, I got He's one a tough game. Up. Dude. Yeah, he was no joke. He, he had played in the NHL. He had played in the uh, Toronto Maple Leafs. He fought some real tough guys like Tony Twist and some other badasses. And uh, you know, he understood why I was there. I was there to fill in for the tough guy that was on the team that was injured, and uh, and he knows I was just. So I wasn't picking him out just to be an asshole. I mean, he knows I was trying to make a name for myself and he was a good guy. He gave me a shot and, uh, and he won the fight. There's no two ways about it. You know, if anyone has seen my book, the cover of my book was a picture that was taken five minutes after the fight. I, nice he, wrecked me. 
Yeah, nice shine. I was right. And um, but was like that the Winnipeg Jets farm team at the time. Yes, correct. That was Moncton, the Moncton Hawks in the American League. And, uh, and I, I tell everyone, listen, you know, you're not going to win them all anyway. But for me to come from skating on a pond just a couple of years earlier, that was a glorious moment to be able to square off with a guy like Bia Lois, who was considered the heavyweight champion of the league in the American Hockey League, which is the second best hockey league in the world. Did you? What uh, was your dream? Sorry, I was just going to say. Did I was you just going to say, what was your dream up? at that point? Was that? I'm sorry. What did you say, Jamie? No, go on, boy. Go on. I was just going to say, did you know you were getting like called up to the A for this? Like, this is your guy. You're gonna, you're gonna line up against Frankie. Our guy's hurt. You're gonna have to go. And what was the honor like? Like you say, from skating on a pond fucking two years ago, and all of a sudden now you're in the AHL. Yeah. Um, well, I knew when I got called up, I got a notice from a friend of mine who was a scout in the NHL, and he knew uh, that this particular team needed somebody. And he had said to me, listen, you know, they've got three or four real tough guys and you're going to have to fight one of these guys just to make your call up worthy, so to speak. And, uh, and I did try to go after a guy. Um, his name is Ryan Vandenbush. Tough uh, he played, shit too. He played in the NHL for a long time. He's really tough. And, uh, and no one really knew me at the time. So I remember talking to Vandenbush off the face off, you know, it's just saying, Hey, give me a shot. Let's go. And he basically told me to go fuck off. And, and I get it because I was a nobody. <laughs> um, but my second shift, I was able to get up against Baya Lois. And again, like I said, I mean, did I really think I was going to win the fight? Probably not. But it was just about showing up, taking advantage of the situation that was given to me and just doing what I said I would do, which was step up for my team. What was your dream then? You, you got that game in AHL. Did you ever think that you were going to make it to the NHL? Was that even a focus for you? Yeah, I, you know what? I mean, the AHL was really a stretch as it was, to be honest with you. I think that was just a favor and a gift through politics, knowing the right people and just being willing to have a set of balls to do it. Um, the NHL was probably just too far away. And, you know, maybe if I started skating earlier, you know what I mean? Like maybe if I could play the game a little bit better, uh, maybe I could have had a shot legitimately, you know, with the fighting attached to it all. But uh, I just think I started way too late. And of course, it would be the ultimate dream if I had gotten at least one game in the NHL. Because well, Google would have the huge. movie. Yeah, I mean, the movie. Google would have come out 20 years ago. Yeah, yeah, oh, God, yeah. yeah that would have been an <laughs> unbelievable story. So, you know, I, for me, the American Hockey League, that's my NHL. So when, when you get there, was. Was it completely as you expected or is it miles different? Well, I mean, the hockey itself, yeah. the way these guys could play, how good they were, how fast they were, how big they were, how, um, you know, just how polished they were for hockey players. I, I couldn't get over just practicing with them. And, you know, I couldn't even keep up. I mean, it was a joke. It was stupid. Um, but, you know, they Sounds welcomed like me. <laughs> yeah, they welcomed me. Yeah, they, uh, you know, they welcomed me in the locker room with open arms. I mean, because they knew what I was there for, and and no one in that room wanted to do what I was going to do. So believe me, they they loved me for the for the couple of days I was there. We hear loads of minor league stories, wild stories, and stuff that happened way back when, particularly from the eighties and nineties. What was probably the wildest thing that you saw while you were playing there? You know, on the ice. When there's a bench clearing brawl, that's crazy shit because you never know who's going to suck a puncher from behind. There's no one to really protect you. There's only a couple of refs and linesmen, so to speak. And I mean, if you're squaring off with some guy and you're focused on the guy in front of you and all of a sudden from the side, someone caves the side of your ear in. Prison I mean, rules, baby. Yeah, that's what it is. It's like a, it's like a street fight for real. And so you got to really just kind of be sharp on your feet and watch what's going on. So, um, I mean, the, I the difference between the street fight is most of the guys on the ice know how to throw a punch. Right, right. So, <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, so bench clearing brawls, those are really wild. I mean, it's just, it's out of control for 15, 20 minutes for sure until people run out of gas and they get tired of the lines when they're finally able to break it up. Um, and I've been in a few of those. And like I said, in the heat of the moment, you're really focused on what's going on. But when it's over, you're sitting back in a locker room going, holy shit, that was unbelievable. <laughs> and of course the fans love it right fans are going oh, crazy oh 
insane. I, I, I used to love a bench clearance. It's been fucking yeah. years. Because you can't keep your eyes focused on one thing. You're all over the place watching everyone. I've only got That's... one that works anyway. I was fucked with a bench clearance. That's what I am. Right? <laughs> <laughs> is is there any any players that you you obviously you're very late to the game you grow up watching arguably the toughest generation of ice hockey players ever to live is there any players that you kind of looked up to and you thought fuck i love that tough guy obviously a boston yeah. guy so yeah absolutely you know i lucked out i got to meet a bunch of guys when i was just starting off guys like paul stewart who played with quebec and uh nick for who played with the Rangers, yeah. um, a guy named Kurt Walker, who played with the Toronto Maple Leafs. And, and these guys all lived in my area and I got to meet them. And, and, you know, unlike the general public who thought I was fucked up for trying to, re, you know, reach this crazy <laughs> dream, these guys, these guys, they took me in and they tried to help me. Like they would get me out on the ice and they would show me and they would give me tips like Paul Stewart. You know, he helped me with my balance and where to grab guys and where not to grab guys and just how to defend yourself the best way. And um, so I had guys like that who are my real idols and my heroes that I looked up to and I studied them and how they won fights, but then how they lost fights. And I tried to learn from that. What about It's the... funny how like Sorry, these, right, Andy. these days, like <clears throat> it's much more sort of like passion fights. There's just two guys that either just tie up um, and it's kind of boring or they just like, it's pretty open, but over and done with pretty quick because they don't kind of want to get hit. Like you watch the old fight tapes and it's like some of the fights to kind of hold off, throw, throw. But back then, like you knew you were playing a game of rock and sock and robots. And it yeah, was just... There wasn't, yep, there wasn't a lot of defense back in those days. Guys weren't like really scientists as far as tying guys up and being smart about their fighting. And so you're right, they'd be wide open and, and it was like, Live by the sword, die by the sword. If you get caught and you get knocked out, show up tomorrow night, maybe you'll catch the next guy on his chin. And, and that's the way yeah. I fought that way because I wasn't going to be a type of guy that was a wrestler or a grappler. Or I was going to try and tie guys up. I didn't have that good a balance. And I had the fighting <laughs> background, so I knew I could punch with both hands. It was just a matter of getting my hands free from his grip so that I could throw away. And, um, and I kind of lived that way. And it's not the best way to do it, but, you know, I'm still here, so fuck it. UK fans, if you <laughs> UK fans who were around in my generation, if you think of somebody kind of in the mold of Owen Bennett that signed for Telford, the guy was tough as nails, but he literally started skating when he was 17 years old. He weak skater, weak balance, but hey, fuck, he, he would come out and drop his gloves with anybody. So like, I kind of think that gives. I get bit, up like, with a smile on his face. Yeah, and just be like, "Yeah, that's fun. <laughs> Let's do it again." Straight <laughs> yeah, back. Right? And like, you'd I, love this kid. You'd, you'd love, love this guy. Kid. Oh, he, he just did he, did he get to go anywhere besides your leagues? No, but like you see him skate, he did fucking well enough to go to those leagues. <laughs> like right. he's he's a he's a great kid and like tough as tough as nails. But yeah, real locker room guy as well. Oh, what yeah. locker room guy? Right. Did you? Uh, I can see you've got uh, a mass collection of pictures on the wall behind you. <laughs> let's uh, let's let's talk that through to some of our to some of our listeners. What have you got on the wall behind you there? They're just guys that I've met over the years. Uh, some of them played in the minor leagues. Some of them played in the NHL. And, you know, I've always been a hockey fight fan in general. So, you know, I followed a lot of these guys that I have on my wall. And like I said, at one point or another, um, I was really fortunate for about eight years. I got to work for the Boston Bruins after I was done playing hockey. And if you can believe it, I actually got hired by them to go down into the minor league team, the Providence Bruins in the American League, and, and teach guys how to f defend themselves, basically. You know, of course, we want to say how to fight, but the proper etiquette would be back then was how to defend yourself because they would have... Self-defense self on ice classes. Of course, and you need that, especially if you're a European player who doesn't play North American <laughs> style or you're a college kid, right? If you're a college kid, you're wearing a full face mask to go in now from college to the American League where you just have a helmet and you could get your ass kicked some night. So you better know what you're doing. And so, like I said, a lot of these pictures in the back here are just guys that I've met over the years through various stages. Okay, so you're not going to name drop. So I'm going to name drop for you. Uh, Col <laughs> oh. Colton Orr was on, yeah. uh, he was on, I, oh, 
Bruins. So, forgive, yeah, but forgive me. I the name of the podcast, the Fighters Podcast or the Hockey Fight Podcast. I can't remember the name of the podcast, but anyway, I was watching him and he brings you up and he talks about you bring in a fucking heavy bag down from the rafters. Right. And him just tying on and just yeah. bagging himself on the heavy bag after practice and stuff. Right. Yeah. So that, that podcast was called Fight Stories. That's it. Fight and, Stories. Um, and, they're, and they're just a bunch of guys like you guys who are into it. And they find guys to interview that like to, you know, smash heads. And, um, <laughs> and, and, all, and Colton was a great guy when I was in Providence. Uh, we got him his first year as a rookie. And, um, you know, he and Absolute I just hit nails. it off. Yeah, he was really a tough kid. And, um, you know, we hit it off really well because I was kind of like a specialized coach for a guy like him who he's never had before. And, uh, you know, we would spend hours together during the week on the ice working out, working on drills. I would incorporate a lot of boxing drills on the ice, punching with both hands, power punching, balance. And it's tough to teach somebody how to take a punch, but there's certain things you can do to lessen the you know, straight blow. The shock. Yeah, of course, exactly. And um, and a guy like Colt Moore, he was a great student and he loved it. And he, I mean, look at him. He had an incredible career up there. Great career and his toughest yeah. shot too. Right. And another guy, he spoke about it on his own podcast. It was John Scott. Oh, God, yeah. Now, yeah, you're, talk, get... you're talking about one of the, the top guys in the last maybe 15 years ever. And he said you had NHL a big, All -Star. Big, big, oh yeah, and an All-Star. But he said you had a, a good part to play in that. Talk us through your yeah, relationship I, with John. I, yep, I got to meet him one summer. He went to a power skating, um, like a two-week power skating type of camp, and it happened. So just on like, that note, sorry, sorry to interrupt there, but like no. what um what a lot of people listening to this and a lot of sort of like anti-fight fans don't understand is that like right. the guys that do that do this role, it doesn't their job doesn't stop because they're good at facey punchy time. Like these guys, like they go off the ice, they spend their summers power skating so that they can develop their hockey as well. Um, for a lot of players, knowing how to fight and being good at fighting on ice is kind of circumstantial. Like you're big and then you get in a fight and it's like, oh shit, that's my ticket to play at this level. But then to right. stay there, there's so much work that you have to do behind the scenes that people just don't see. That's true. And, and, and you kind of hit the nail on the head. You know, you got a guy like John Scott, who's like six, seven, he's a big guy, but he was a college player and he didn't come into the pro game to be a fighter. He was forced in it because he was a big guy and he would have say a smaller guy like me, who's trying to make a name for himself, like picking on him, making him fight me so that I can look good. Like I'm going to beat this big guy up. And so Just go John for the biggest Scott, guy. Like if you get dummy, you lost yeah. to a bigger guy. If you win, you beat up a bigger guy. It's a win-win for a smaller guy. Of course, like, it I'm, is, right? I'm only six foot. Like that was like my right. my go-to was just like, who's the biggest fucker on the team? Let's go. And if you can beat that guy, you're a hero, and everyone loves you, and the scouts and the coaches love you. So, so a guy like John Scott realized fast that you know I'm a big guy. Either I have to use this, or I'm gonna I'm gonna be pushed out of the league. And, uh, and so again, I met him one summer, he was in my area doing some power skating, like you had said, these guys train year round. And, um, and I got on the ice with him and I kind of did my thing with him like I had done previous years with the Bruins organization. And, uh, and uh, we really got along great for two weeks. I mean, he really loved what we had worked on. And he came out of the gate that year. And I'm telling you, he probably had six or seven fighting majors right out of the first month of October alone. And, uh, and it bought him a lot of room and a lot of space because guys were saying, I'm not fighting this guy. He's way too tall, really long in the arms. And he's demolishing guys that are other heavyweights in the league. So, you know, that was his ticket to stay in the NHL, believe me. And he did pretty well at it. I just want to ask you about something about your elite prospects. And it, it's something I've not seen before. The Miramichi Gagnon Packers and the MBSHL. What, what league was that and where was that at? That was that, that was that one, men's right? senior league we talked about a few was minutes it? ago, right? Okay. Yep. And that's where I went up and uh, I was the only American import. And uh, I'll tell you what, there were some tough motherfuckers up in that league. And they all wanted me because they knew I was there to fight. And, you know, here I am, Yankee Doodle from America. <laughs> and they're trying to, they're literally trying to fight me every There's night. There's no nights off then. No, they wanted no. me out of the league. They were trying to beat me up and get me out of the league. Every like that, those leagues are full of farm boys as well. Like for our listeners oh, that yeah. don't know, 
like yeah. there's there's money in like senior hockey in Canada. Like oh, yeah. right. le- legit money. Like you've got right. um I think Theo Fleury even played like he did before he, before he came to the UK. It, right. it, yeah. And, and I, these, I these leagues are legit. Right. And I got paid for being there and I got paid per fight. And <laughs> every, the more I fought <laughs> Yeah, the, more I, yep. <laughs> the more I fought, the more the owner of the team realized that people were coming into the games and paying the ticket prices to watch more and more that the fan base was growing because I kept fighting and, and a couple of other guys that I play with, they were fighting. So we were all getting extra money on the side to continue fighting. It was crazy. Yeah. These, those leagues are nuts. Like um, yeah. I, I was supposed to play a couple of games in the, like the Manitoba one. Yeah. Um, but like I was trying out for junior B, well, junior A, and it kind of coincided then junior B, but whatever, that's another story. But like the, the money being offered around it is always like, it's away from the major cities. So you've got like the kind of the, the sub cities or like large towns that these teams are in and they right. are just nuts for it. Like the fans just love it. Exactly. And if you're, you know, if your barn can only hold three or 4,000 people, you want to try to sell that place out as often as you can. And if that requires bringing in a guy to fight and, and rile up the crowd, you're going to pay that fighter to keep dropping the gloves every night. Can we go back to your, your fight coaching on ice? So where did that role come from? Because that sounds like my dream job. You know, I just, like I said, I lucked out. I, I had the fighting background for boxing. And I remember sitting with a couple of people I'm friends with from the Boston Bruins organization. <laughs> and I kind of I persuaded them I told them, you should get me on the ice with all your European and your college kids. These guys are big draft picks for you. They're, they're a major investment for your organization. And you can't have them out there being scared or nervous. You know, or when playing the, the bongo blows, drums like that Washington guy. Yeah. You know, like when the whistle blows and a scrum breaks out and, you know, and you're a young kid that doesn't even know how to defend yourself, you might get paired off with a guy like Doug Smith or a guy like Colt Noor who's going to kick the shit out of you. You better at least know how to tie him up because guys like that, they'll play scared. And your investment that you just drafted him and you paid him a huge contract is right down the drain. So anyway, um, you know, Nikki, to answer your question, I just lucked out knowing the right people that who actually got me on the ice and it all worked out. I got to work with the Bruins for about eight years. I worked with four or five other NHL teams throughout that span doing the same thing, teaching their young guys how to defend themselves. On a similar note to that, um, the the late Derek Bugard <clears throat> did a similar thing and got like quite a lot of criticism for it, like teaching junior players how to actually fight. Um, is that something like I? Is that something you kind of considered or had seen before that happened? Or my my time doing what I did as an instructor, so to speak, was before Bugard. So fighting was still relatively. You know, it was pretty popular back then. Um, I think he was down on the back end of the mountain, so to speak, when fighting was starting to slowly be dissolved by the NHL, you know, the instigator rule and all that stuff. So um, I, I can see how he ran into some roadblocks for sure. What do you make of the instigator rule? I think it sucks. I mean, it's ruined the game. <laughs> you know, the, yep. the, guys, the guys have been used to policing themselves forever. You know, if you if you cheap shot me and I go after you, I'm going to get an instigator for beating you up and you just chop me in the back of the leg with your stick or something. Bullshit. Mac. How did it come about that you wrote your book? Was it from, I think I wrote, I read up about on you, you said that you kept a journal of all the fights that you were in. I say that again, I'm sorry. Get get so a Paisley translator in here. Right. Yeah, we're 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 working on subtitles. <laughs> we get a Paisley Sorry, translator. <laughs> Basically, uh, that was uh, how did the idea to write your book come about? Right. So uh, <laughs> the kid that got me on skates back in the day, Adam Fatazio, he was one of my best friends in my neighborhood, and uh, and he was the one that decided, you know, all these stories you have, minor league games, all the fights, the bus rides, the lifestyle of being a minor league tough guy, you know, we should put a book together. And uh, he was the one that kind of chronologically put it in order from skating on the pond right up to the East Coast League, the American League, all the fights. And uh, we totally lucked out. You know, we got it published and, uh, and it sold pretty well. It, it went wild for a little, you know, there was such an underground of hockey fight fans that read it and loved it. So we lucked out. I think the, the uh, did the movie okay. help with uh, with sales? 
So the book was written first and a, um, uh, I'm going to say about eight or nine years later is when the movie, someone who was a, on a writing team in Hollywood, some guy read the book and he kind of started off by saying. He, he starred in it, didn't he? I'm sorry. Uh, I, he, he was like one of the main characters. I forget his name. Jay uh, the skinny guy. That's Jay Baruchel. By the yeah, way, he I, loves I really, hockey. I yeah. really want to interview him. By the way, like, yeah, he's a big Montreal. He's a Canadian hockey fan. nerd, man. Like, yeah, he's he'd, a, be, he'd be great for this podcast. Yeah, um, there, there's a couple of guys. There's a couple of guys. I'll send you some names, but there's some serious dudes that you should try to get a hold of that love hockey. They got a serious background in it. But Jay Baruchel is one of those guys. Adam Scorgi, he just had a great yeah. movie come out, and um, but my book just was a back you know, like the, the beginning stages of writing a script and they used it for just reference points. And we were, Adam and I, we were consultants throughout the whole process. You know, they would ask me questions like, hey, what would you say to this guy in the face-off? How would you get him to fight you? You know, and what happens, what do you do during the daytime? Like, what do you, what's a minor league guy do? Sleep so they kind of, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, drinking women, right? Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Were you there through the whole filming then? Were you were you there through the whole process? You were there as a consultant day on day for it? No, not at all, actually. I was only there for about a week, if you can believe it, because um, I had a little role in the second movie. There's a sequel um, to the original. Um, I've watched it. I'm sorry? I watched it. It's, it's oh, okay. not as good as the first one. I think it's called Last of the Enforcers. <laughs> Goon 2, Correct. Last of the Enforcers. Yeah, That's and, the one, and yeah. Listen, I'm not going to shit on either one of them. I mean, I thought the first one was a little better than the second one. It was miles better. Yeah, and if you can, <laughs> yeah. even, if you, if you can even believe it, they're talking about a third movie. Oh, what? Like no. Mighty Ducks 3 and fucking oh, Slapshot Slap 3. What are they going to do? Yeah. The, no, Slapshot 4, the junior right. league, where they're, where face cages. Right. Oh, so I don't on. know where they're going to go with a script on this one, but nevertheless, there's rumor that there could be a third. Um but, you know, hey, listen, I, I don't have that much of a say in the whole process, to be honest with you. And I'm grateful they keep me involved as little as they do. So, you know, I feel special. <laughs> <laughs> How did you feel about uh, Sean William Scott being uh, the the lead? Because he's obviously my sort of generation. He's the American pie. He Jeff was Lark. the funny guy. He was the guy that fucking took down chicks. Yeah. He, he yeah. was the guy that... Just, you know, told stories, and then right. all of a sudden, he's the guy playing you in the movie. That's not too right. bad. You know, he'll always be known as Stifler. He yeah. was great in that movie. Um, and, and eleven inch penis around. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> but um, you know, when I first saw the movie for the first time, I, I have to be honest. I was a little. I don't know. I, I don't know if I was disappointed or not, but I just felt like the character who's supposedly portraying me they really made him out to be a, a complete jackass. And I met... He came across Sean... like dumb as fuck. Like, right. right. You know, my, like, my, my perception of, like, or preconceived um, perception of you was like just some meathead that, you know, worked <laughs> in a bar, got in a couple of scraps. And right. it's completely yeah. the opposite. Well, and that's how they portrayed him in the movie, right? As a complete dope. And uh, he yeah. wasn't good enough to do anything else in life. His, his father was a doctor and his his brother was a doctor and, and here he is, he's going to be a, a fighter because he's an idiot. And so I understand well, how they wrote this script and how they portrayed him as, but obviously it reflects on me personally, because now I'm looking saying, wow, am I really that big of a dope? <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but Sean William Scott, I mean, I've met him a number of times. I mean, he's a great guy. I mean, you guys would love talking to him. He's a regular guy and he's a fantastic actor. Oh, great. Actor. Yeah. You did a lot of filming in Winnipeg for that, right? Or they did? Yeah, the, the, the whole second one was up in Winnipeg. And, um, you know, there was some serious talent up there for actors. I mean, you know, I mean... I'm I thought he was going to say in the bars, off the ice. Well, the talent... I, mean, I can the attest bars, to that. Was, I lived there for a bit. I, 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 and I my family's even, from there. I don't yeah, know why that means comment. talent, but... <laughs> yeah, we, yeah, it's we, not we like Max family's sisters. <laughs> 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 That's great. <laughs> oh no, I've never seen a picture of like Max's sister. By the way, Doug, Max's sister is like a fucking 11. It's ridiculous. Nice. <laughs> I love it. Send it to me or send me her only fans. I'll, I'll, <laughs> I've got three sisters, mate. None of them have got only fans, anyway. 
But you know, <laughs> back on topic. Back on topic. Yeah, back on topic. So, so when this this whole movie comes out, and now it's obviously on Netflix, and you know, the English fans they don't know too much about. Uh, the English people, as opposed to English fans, the fans know the game okay, but like the Joe public go, huh, what? I, I saw a movie that reminded me of you. It was, uh, and I go, what, Goon? And they go, yeah, 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 that's it. That, that, that's the one. Do you, right. get, do you get like a lot, just, you get, I think uh, as fighters, as people that drop the gloves on the ice and people that took the pimps, it, you get that word, Goon. It's never bothered me. I know it pisses like Ty Domi off. I know right. it pisses another couple of guys off. How do you feel the name goon? And I, you know what? I, I certainly wasn't an actual goon. I wasn't a guy who was going out there to purposely hurt somebody. You know, like cross checking them from behind and and you know and and sparing them in the balls and stuff like that. I mean, I wasn't that type of guy. But we only used the term goon on the cover of our book because we knew what the term meant. And we used it almost as like a grabber to grab the attention of hockey fans to go along with the picture of my face, which is the big black eye. And so it was a, it was an easy one, two punch, so to speak. It, it was, a, you know, it was all for sales. And again, I don't consider myself a goon and I never would ever call any other tough guy a goon. It's just a stupid name that someone made up years ago and just kind of always hung around the hockey world. Well, like the, the difference between exactly as you say, a goon, like someone that just goes around, like some people call them agitators. Like I yep. personally, I think they're goons. Like they act like, like goons. Like you right. can't touch me. I'm going to be cheap. Right. But anyone that does the role that, that we've all done, you've done to like AHL level, you know what you're getting into. Nine times out of 10, unless it's a bench clearing brawl or someone's really overstepped the mark, the other person knows what they're getting into. They've signed of off. Of course. And it's fun. That's hundred percent true. <laughs> Just throw it out there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, I do we, miss it. We got the group chat, was... group chat going last night, and it's uh, the messages start coming in. The obviously first game of the show, and Bandy's like, "Didn't think I missed it, but fuck, I want to punch someone in the face right now." <laughs> it <was just> like, <laughs> yeah, it doesn't it doesn't go away. I'm 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 sat there watching last night. And I'm like, fuck, we're we're thirty minutes in. Somebody hit somebody. Somebody, <laughs> somebody body check somebody. Like, let's go right. here. You don't yeah. have to give each other concussion. I know that's the big, big thing now. But yeah. fuck, bumper body. You're all like, you're all ripped to shit. You've all got great nutrition. You're all jacked. You're all fast. Right. Bumper fucking body. We know you can do it. We watch. I've the never got a concussion from a fight. Right. I've never got a concussions. Fight. I've that's got concussions tough... from cheap shots. But... Yeah, and that's the tough thing. I just I just spoke about this a couple of nights back with somebody else. You know, you can look at a guy like Sidney Crosby. He's had more concussions than any Crazy. other fighter. Like, there's no fighter that yeah. gets a concussion as often as Sidney Crosby does. And it's all from body checks and cheap shots when he's not looking and, and whatnot. And, you know, it's... Blindside hits. It's, and also, yeah, just, there's there's no... If you, look, if you look at Lemieux, Gretzky, Sakic, whoever it may be, Right. They had guys on Scotty Parker, McZorley. They oh, had yeah. fucking guys there the whole That's time. Right. Dave Semenko. Uh, you go on. The list goes on. It's just right. meat, like meat. Absolute tough, tough guys. Right. Crosby, who the fuck's he He's got? By himself. Who's he got? Like, oh, yeah. I'm just because me on the other team, Sidney Crosby. I'm not like if I get my chance to hit him and right. I don't have anybody to answer the bell to. Wow, right. I'm gonna fucking, not, I'm gonna smoke him. If George yeah, LaRock's scared, if George LaRock's still there, I'm like, yeah, I'm not gonna hit him when he's got his head down because Big right. Georgie is gonna come and break my jaw. Right, exactly. And unfortunately, the league has changed to the point where superstars like Crosby, Ovechkin, all these guys, they're getting run at now by these little twerps who know there's no one there to kick their ass after. What like Svechnikov and fucking Ovechkin just did it himself, just one bum. <laughs> <laughs> But it Straight is animal. But right. Yeah, by the way, if these young guys are going after a Vetchkin, they need to realize he's 125 kilos of fucking right. pure Russian beef. But yeah. on, on that note, actually, what was um so like you've obviously seen the game develop. You worked for the Boston Bruins. Um from when you were in the game, you were breaking in. Like um, like let's be realistic. Now your story doesn't happen. Right. And I think that's like a big draw of it is like, this is so such a foreign concept to the game right. today. Right. Like someone that can just, that can pretty much just fight, no offense. 
Um, I'm sure you won't take any. What do you that. mean, no offense? Um, what the fuck else could you do, you dickhead? <laughs> well, exactly. But like, I, <laughs> no fuck, offense. I, 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 I Mac, never played in the NHL. To this guy? <laughs> um, but like, but you made it to the NHL based on that. These days, that doesn't happen. Um, right. Like, what, but what have you seen in terms of like even like skill guys and and how they. Uh, how they act off the ice and nutrition training right. that side of things like what well, differences think, have you seen since your day i think you've kind of hinted to the obvious answer the game has changed dramatically and there, there are no doug smiths anymore because there's no room for me and the game has changed physically um it's all about speed and guys who are small can now make it because they can fly and if it's all about skill, you can make it. It has no, I back, I made it through the back door. I backdoored my way in because fighting was allowed. But if it was all about skill, I would never be Doug Glatt. It wouldn't have never happened because I sucked. You still watch <laughs> hockey, no? <laughs> Say that again. You still watch hockey? Uh, you know what? I'll watch it occasionally. I'm not a big NHL fan. Um, I do watch the American League, the uh, minor league hockey, because there's still some fighting down there. And I hate to sound so one dimensional, but I, I still love the game when it involves fighters. And, um, you know, like Nick was saying earlier, you know, how many games can you watch where there's not even any body checking? It's pathetic. So I just can't stomach it. I just I'd rather watch. I don't know. I'd, I'd watch reruns of, you know, happy days. I tell you what, so a buddy of mine, the the Don Cherry Rock and stuff. Yeah, uh, well, essentially what right. I'm about to say, a buddy of mine is very new to hockey, two three years. He does. He, he's never even seen like me or any of these boys play. Like he's he's that new to to hockey. No real NHL following. He just follows a local team here. And I was like, right, I'm gonna sit down. I'm gonna put the '96 Red Wings versus Avalanche playoff series and you're gonna fucking yes. sit and you're gonna yep. fucking watch it and he's sitting there and he's like oh fuck yeah. shit oh my god oh my god what is guys are getting crushed yet from behind guys are getting right. two-handed you skate past the bench yeah. you get squirted with water you get elbowed right. like but you you was you didn't go and get a coffee in the period like until the period break you you didn't walk and leave because at any moment in that game something could have happened and hockey right. is not like that anymore and even even your skilled guys who played on those teams oh, yeah. still have to play tough. Started the brawl, right? They got to play tough. They got to play tough, or you're going to get pushed out. So you go out and you start shit because you know you got a heavyweight who's going to come off the bench and clean it all up for you after, and that's fun stuff. The bet the ratings were through the roof, yeah, right? <laughs> Mac, what? I thought you'd wait and say something, mate. I just, no, no, no. Don't no. lie. <laughs> yeah, I, I, just, I, just, I was just, like, we, we've been waffling on, and Max just sat there patiently waiting for his, like, really serious question. So so you <laughs> boys over there, I mean, have you had any tough guys that you know that have made it over, say, to North America, who have made it as a tough guy? I mean, what, what's, your, what's your following in sports as far as hockey fighting goes? Uh, right, okay. So in terms of anyone coming that way to do the job, no. In terms of wow. guys over here that are willing to do the job, and I've fought plenty of guys that have came from that way, yes. So you got to think, all of the guys that don't... So all of these a AHL killers that don't make it to the show, they got to go play somewhere, and they got to get paid. And the only yeah. league ever, realistically, in Europe where you're allowed to go shit kick has been the UK. So... Okay, yeah. Unless you're good enough to play KHL, which... Oh, yes. But, yeah, like, the only other place you're going to get to go as a legitimate tough guy, play some hockey, earn some good coin, and have yeah, guys... Yeah, because KHL, you got to be, scrap. like, a Yablonski, you got to be... Yes, right. Like, that All kind of guys. ilk. Right. Now, it, where is Sheffield for you guys? Where do oh. I live? Where he lives. Yeah, Mac lives there. Okay, because I, I know... I'm actually, been... I'm actually in France, and, like... The French don't fight, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, you could be the one guy. <laughs> yeah. Well, I tried that, but they said no. Right. Too many penalties. <laughs> yeah. But I, I mean, but I know a lot of a lot of tough guys. When there's nowhere else to go, they have gone over to your area, and they have yeah. made a, uh, an extra couple of two or three seasons with some money in their pockets, still fighting because your fans want to see it too. Well, so I'll give you some. I'll, I'll give you a quick list of guys, and then you can run them off. So, so we've had Wade Belak, Eric Cairns. We had Graham Belak, yeah. we had Mel Anglestad, Paul yeah. Ferrone, 
Andre Payet, Jeremy Cornish, uh, Dodie Wood, Dodie yeah. Wood uh, Dennis Vial, yeah. Barry Nykaar. All, all established NHL and minor league guys. All Mike Ware, just yeah. legit killers. Like, absolute right. stone cold killers. Brad Voth. Brad Voth. Like, honestly, the amount of minor league guys that have come over here who are just... Hey, they're every, a lot of these guys are Oh, who was the, who's the guy in Nottingham? John Craig Yes, that's the one. So when I broke into the elite, I, I broke into the Bainstoke team, played the elite league when I was like 16. So my first first game, I was lined up my first shift was against Mike Ware. And then the, wow. the night after my, my second game, I lined up was John Craighead away in Nottingham. Wow. And I played in front of like fucking five, 600 people before Bainstoke. We maybe had like, I don't know, 2000. Right. You go to Nottingham, there's like 6,000 people there. They're all wearing Craighead wigs because this guy's just a fucking <laughs> animal. I'm 16, I'm still in the grill, line up next to him. And, you know, so there was, like, and that was fun for me because yeah. I was like, I love this shit because I've watched you punch guys in the face. I fucking love this. Right. And now I'm still next to you. But right. The kids don't do that anymore. I don't, I don't, the, apart from one, I know one guy, Ty Kafka, who's 16, who actually, he wants to go and like he, he's still got that kind of old school vibe about him. He wants to play that role. Right. I, sadly, I don't know if that role is going to be there for him. Luckily, he can still play hockey and still do that. But it sucks that that role is not there because there's kids coming through that are like us. Of course, there right. is. Of course, there are. And and I agree with you. I don't know if the role is going to be available for kids like that who maybe don't have the skill skating wise to play the game at that level but they maybe can get in because they are they got a set of balls and they'll drop the gloves and they'll play physical if, but especially if you can play hockey and play physical and then as a subset of that like yes. drop the mitts i Correct. think that role is going to be there for a, a, a few more years to come not many but a few more can i look at like a different can... angle though as a guy who had adhd growing mm-hmm. up and struggled to learn and struggled to know hockey was my release and probably kept me out of jail being able to drop my shit on the ice and have right. a good toe-to-toe scrap with somebody right. allowed my brain, immature brain at that stage, enough that I wasn't going to go have a mad tilt with a guy on the street and get in trouble. That, it'd be interesting because there's going to be kids in my position now that are not doing so good at school, maybe getting in trouble, maybe don't know how to play that out. I always had the hockey side to be able to go have a release, almost like boxing or MMA now. Right. I think kids are going to have to go down the MMA or boxing route if they want to have that release. Yeah, and I agree. I don't think it's going to happen on the ice. So you're going to get kicked off. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> from your from the policing side of things, like um, just kind of like trying to, to tie into that. Do you do much community work? Like, you know, previously, um, it like hockey, well, hockey and like just sports in general, it's a great outlet for, um, for like for troubled kids that are yet to kind of find their path in life right um, right but particularly like especially you know from our perspectives it's like hey look if you want to punch someone in the face just go play hockey and then it's fine and right, you can right. kind of get that out of your system yeah like, exactly but you know the... for me personally you know i mean I, like a, a little kid young kid so to speak growing up in the neighborhood they look at me now i'm a cop and there's still a little bit in our area not much respect for the police um and sometimes kids will look up to you and they'll listen to what you say and and like you just said you know kids that want to have some aggression you know take them to the gym let them box or maybe go out in the ice and play hockey but uh i try to use my role as as a cop and uh and of course i can fall back on the celebrity status so to speak that i've gained from hockey um and i try to use it in the right way as often as I can, obviously. Um, it, it's not like people think, you know, oh, you must be beating guys up on the street like you used to in hockey. It's certainly not like that whatsoever. But um, it's good that sometimes people might recognize you or want to talk about stuff like the past. You know, it's good for, a, you know, a conversation. Yeah, for sure. How hard have you found your, your job lately? I just want to, just on your police aspect, us from afar here, we're looking at like America and all the stuff that's going over there, the stuff with George Floyd, BLM, the stuff with Trump. It just Crazy. seems like a melting pot. What's, what's your day-to-day work like and how hard is it? How What are these sort of aspects? How do they affect your day-to-day job? 
You know, I'm lucky personally because I, I work in a small town, which is south of Boston. Of course, Boston is a big city and, uh, and they've certainly got their own problems in there. And um, I'm not into politics. I don't give a shit one way or the other who's president in a sense. Um, but it's been crazy over here. I mean, if you saw what took place at the Capitol, you know, they oh, mad. I mean, it was insanity. And now it's getting leaked out that people that work in the Capitol and people who were maybe in Trump's party organized this whole thing. Did you not see you know, him though? Did you not see him come up to the gate and the guy at the gate kind of just went, uh, okay, yeah. just, uh, just opened the gate and got the fuck out right. of the way. Right. And those people certainly were not peaceful protesters. They were there to cause problems. Someone died. And, uh, she got yeah, shot. So was, she got shot. In the, she got it shot was crazy to watch that. Yeah, it was crazy to watch that on the news. It's insane. I wouldn't have wanted to been a cop there that day. So, so definitely not. So, like Mac was saying, have you found since like the George Floyd and stuff, that incident there? Have you found being a policeman more difficult? Um, for me personally, no, not really. I mean, I, I, I work in a good area, like I said, and um, I haven't really. There's certain parts of our country that are definitely affected by it, um, but I think my neck of the woods, so to speak. Is is oh I'm doing okay I'm doing okay. Good. Can I take you away from the the police work and onto your coaching? I, I read that you did a bit of high school coaching and stuff like <laughs> yeah, that. Yeah, you mentioned the police and what's his brain just goes. Fuck. Yeah, fuck. <laughs> I'm sitting here thinking of excuses. I'm like, this guy is hacking my fucking Zoom right now. What's going on? <laughs> um, you know what? I did coach. I coached my my high school that I uh, went to for 21 years. And um, our team actually won the state championship three times awesome. over the 21 years I was there. And I was really fortunate. I got um, elected into the Hockey Hall of Fame for uh, the state of Massachusetts, where I'm from. So I've definitely got a few um, great memories from my years coaching the kids. And, uh, and I, was an, I was an easy inspiration for the kids because it would be so easy for me or the other coaches to say, you know, Look at Doug. He didn't start skating until he was 19 years old, almost 20. And look how far he went. What's your excuse? You know, you should be out here working hard. You've got a goal in mind too. You want to play college or you want to play professional. All it takes is real hard work, which is all I did for three or four years. I just busted my balls every day and was geared and focused on the task at hand. So why can't you do that? So it was easy to rile the kids up and get them psyched every practice and every day. And college is huge in Boston. Obviously, you've got BU yeah. and you've got Boston College. Not only you've got you've got many other schools there, and you've got D3 right. schools. And yeah. like growing up in Massachusetts, it, the goal is to go to college, right? It's not necessarily yeah. to go junior A, uh, no, major no, junior. Right. It's it's college hockey, division one, um, you know, hockey east hockey is our east, area. Yeah. And it's huge between Maine and Vermont and Harvard and Boston and BU and Northeast. I mean, it's endless. And um, if you can make it there, that's pretty successful, you know, and, and then it's from there. Do you get drafted or maybe do you get a tryout as a free agent? Because if you come from a division one college, like say BU or BC, you got a pretty bright future ahead of you, especially if you're putting up some points. Even if you're Are not, you still if doing you're Paris. Really? Say know. that again. Uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, even, even if you're you're not like the the point scorer, George Paros. Yeah, was, uh, I mean, look at George. He, guy went to, that... he went to Princeton, right? Who would think a guy from Princeton was going to turn out to be an NHL heavyweight fighter? But I mean, he was smart enough to recognize his worth in pro hockey, and he made the most of it. And there's another great guy you'd love to interview someday. I'd love to make that happen, <laughs> Mac. What was you going to say there? Sorry. Fuck knows, Bandy just dived in and started talking shit and put me off my thoughts. Sorry, mate, it's gone. <laughs> I can't remember where, we, where we're at. Uh, yeah, Guy, you got a bit of editing to do here because my brain's gone dead as well. Bandy, what was you uh, talking about with George Paros? Was you more meaning the fact that he's now like in the league? No, just like that oh, okay, he, sorry. he's a, a Princeton graduate um, and like as far as I know, did really well in his, his degree. Um, 
and then went yeah, to think, the NHL. I, I think he might be like an engineer of some sort. I mean, you yeah. know, something, some degree that's just, you know, you would say to yourself, why would you waste your time playing hockey? Yeah, I think he had like a, like, I, I, I don't know how the grading works in the US, like properly, but I think it was like, it was really high. It was like, yes, it's a 4.0 or something like that. Right, right. And then he yeah. was like, I love playing hockey. So <laughs> let's go punch people in the face. <laughs> right, right. In fact, I think John Scott was the same. John Scott came from a, a very prestigious college and was a pretty smart guy. And he winds up being kind of a, you know, a fighter. I'm, I'm not being funny though. If someone's going to pay you, they're probably getting league minimum, maybe a little bit more, but if someone's going to pay you a million bucks to be in the NHL, come on. Right. But just remember, <laughs> like, like you said. You can they, make your money after. Right. But they first started in the minor leagues, right? They started maybe in the yeah. American league and they weren't making big money then. And they're getting the shit kicked out of them every night by someone that wants to make their name off them. And it's like, you're going to stick it out for a year or two or three, just trying to chase your dream to the NHL. You got to give those guys a little credit because they left, again, some kind of a degree on the back burner to chase a dream. So also, like, on, on the engineering side of things, um, I, I know Google hire engineers and then make them like software developers. Like they hire graduates on 150, 200 K like right. it's mad money. Right. And he's so passionate about hockey that, I mean, obviously Google didn't exist back then or maybe it did, but like they weren't as big as they are. Um, and he chose to go and play hockey in the minors for 30, 40. Yeah. Like maybe, may, maybe a little bit more, but not too much more, right? At least your first year or two. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, on, on the point of George Paros, um, like what, what do you make of his role as uh, head of, is it player safety? Player safety. Player safety department? Yeah, it's either like head of safety or head of disciplinary actions or something like that. And, uh, you know, I remember reading a lot when he first got that position and a lot of guys kind of were breaking his balls about it. Like, you know, here you are, you're a tough guy and you know the role yet you're going to discipline the guys that do the same job you used to do. And, um, I, I think, think he's kind of perfect been... for it. Well, at least he's been there, right? Yeah. Like, that's what I'm bull... saying. Like you're not going to bullshit him because he's been there. He knows it all. And yep. so I think, I think it's evolved into a very good position for him. Yeah. Like I, I think the, I don't know how you'd get this to happen, but, the best people to be referees would be like tough guys or agitators because they've broken every rule of the book. They know the call. They know the sign. Like they know the, the signal points when a player is about to do something because they've been right. there. They've done it themselves. And that's just it. I think it's important that, again, like you said, you've got to have played the sport if you're going to coach or, Jesus, even guys that are announcers on the television, you at least play the game so you know what the hell you're talking about, you know? Mm-hmm. It makes a massive you difference. Did you referee, though, didn't you, Doug? Did you, were you not a linesman or a ref at some point? I did some linesman. I actually made it to the uh, minor pro level in the Federal Hockey League. But um, What's just, that league like, by the way? Uh, kind of like the East Coast League. A lot of fighting. Um, not very skilled players, but just guys that are trying to... Who are like... 21 22 to about 25 years old you know maybe out of college want to try to play somewhere for a year or two maybe they'll get brought up to the next level so to speak but uh you know that league you're either a pretty good player or you're a fighter one or the other and um it wasn't a very talented league to say the least you know it's just but for me as a referee or a linesman i should say it was somewhere to go make a buck you know and, and stay in the game I played with a with a guy that was in the uh, FHL as it was at the time. It's now been re- rebranded to the Federal Prospects Hockey League because uh-huh. they're trying to become like more development focused. Right. And, um, he was in the coast and then got sent down there, and he had to sleep on like a, a camping mattress in the living room, <laughs> like in this like this old shack in the middle of nowhere. Right. Like, their rink was an outdoor rink, but it didn't get cold oh. enough, so the ice never oh. froze. Um, and then like, yeah, they, so they had to play all their games on the road. It was, yeah, it was mad. <laughs> that's tough. That, that's not a dream come true. <laughs> uh, definitely not. <laughs> Although like for me, like my, my dream was just to get any kind of buck out of hockey. So right. Right. Dream complete. I, I made right. very little, but I got something. Right. <laughs> so I can't, I can't imagine. It must be very hard for you guys. Even the kids on your area, you know, UK and all that area, 
to get over here. Like you got to really be a standout or know somebody, right? Yeah, pretty much. Like I was yeah. lucky I got a shot because I got a Canadian passport. And oh. an Australian passport. Yeah, there I have an go. Australian passport as well. Um, right. But uh, but yeah, like I was I was lucky in that regard. Right. For, and for so, everyone else. I said it's a tough it's gig. Tough. So if you can if you can get over to Canada maybe and play Canadian juniors or something and you have a shot there, other than that, no one's coming out of your area, right? It's a sad thing. I th- I think the the better option right now, and this is just my my opinion is for the kids to go to Sweden or to go to Finland or to go to Germany because they're now they're now at the stage. Germany are now at the stage where they're starting to produce a serious number of draft picks. It's not going to cost your parents remortgaging the house and right. having to get a fucking crazy visa and, uh, right. you know, a thousand bucks on a flight every time they want to come. And now mum and dad want to come with a little brother and all of a sudden – not only are you having to pay for the kid to be there, it's costing them four thousand bucks every time you want to go as a family to see him. You can fly yeah. to you can fly to Germany also, for like also f- fifty five Canada, pounds from here. So. In, in right. Canada, like if you, you can have imports in junior B, and yep. you can have imports in major junior, right? In junior A, like legit junior A, you Not have to have to a Canadian play. passport. Okay. So, like, I was lucky that like, I could fit into that bracket i never made it because i suck but like i would have fitted into the bracket of uh, of junior a because i had a canadian passport or have a canadian passport yeah yeah but like you know people coming in now it's like junior b like honestly a advice to any kid coming up now go to europe instead because right. junior b is not that great it's not worth it like cool you went to canada like it, these days who fucking cares Right. Uh, and ma- major junior, you got to be a Liam Kirk. Yeah, that's tough. That's real tough. What What is the sport you guys excel at, so to speak, where someone could make it over to the United States as an athlete? The other way around, the obviously soccer or football, as we call it over here, is is the biggest sport, and right. probably followed by rugby and then by cricket. So, right. in terms of actually going to the states, nobody is coming from any of our sports over there. You're in that circumstance. You guys are more likely to want to try uh, and break in over here. You know, if you're a rug- if you're a soccer player, or a rugby guy, you're going to want to come from the state side over here. Right, uh, cricket the same, and then. We would there was a bit of NFL because we used to have NFL Europe. Oh yeah. yes, yeah, right. Um, we I think like we had a, a couple of prospects that right. We got a couple of guys in the NBA have... and stuff like that. Yeah. yeah, I don't I don't I don't really follow those though. Right, like, it's not. My... But I mean, r- rugby is not big over here, and neither is cricket. But I mean, soccer is big, and you know you MLS. must be. Yeah, you but you, but you got to be pretty damn good to leave here to go over to you guys because you guys are. Re- you I mean that, you own it and that's and that's the same same thing yeah. with hockey for the thing is no, it, nobody's ever going to scout since 66 yeah <laughs> right. i know but i mean as just as 20 premier league teams plus championship teams everyone producing youngsters we don't have that with hockey because we we have a distinct lack of ice time a distinct lack of funding a distinct lack of sure. coaching we yeah. have so many so many hurdles in the way you never have any backyard rinks there's none of that shit going on you, right. don't, have, you don't have the weather for it yeah. so you have a whole bunch of hurdles that are just are not there and then you obviously have to compete with football where you can pay you know 35 pounds for a pair of boots and go into your local park and play, and that's it. That, that, that's how much it costs. Right, you, you, right. That, why does your parent want to pay £150 a month and then £2,000 for kit? And then, oh, by the way, you have a game 150 miles away, and then you're back, and then you've got to be at work in the morning. And then you got next weekend. Uh, just, just, just to interrupt here. Sorry. Just Sorry, it's it, true, huh? though, isn't it? Like, yeah, like, it's just it, not no, worth it. Totally true. Um, Doug, like, for any of our, hopefully, like not too many young fans, because we we swear and curse a lot on this podcast. <laughs> but um, but like what what advice do you have for them as young hockey players growing up? Like appreciate we've we've kept you for a long time here, so we'll kind of like start trying to wrap things up a little bit. But um, yeah, like what advice do you have for young kids coming up? Well, I mean, like we said earlier, the game's changing for a guy like Doug Smith or even like yourself who tried to play kind of a a rough and tough type of game. 
it's not about that anymore. It's all about skill. You got to have skates. You got to have wheels. You got to be able to fly and you got to be able to play the game. And it's, and, and you know, like we said, you can be a small guy in the NHL today. You can be five foot three, four or five. You can be a, a lightweight and still make it. If you can skate, it's all about skating. And, um, you know, being a tough guy and being a physical player, I mean, it's just not there like it used to be 10, 15, 20 years ago. So I would tell kids, listen, go to your camps and go to your skills and your conditioning places and, and work on the skills needed because that's the only way you're going to make it. What that's else right. have you got going on apart from um, your hectic police life? Have you got any other involvement or other movie work coming up? Uh, I haven't heard much on the movie. Um, I, I stay involved with hockey. I do a lot of charity work. Um, you know, I try to help out with uh, fundraising events and stuff in my area. And, you know, of course, I use the celebrity status that I've gained from the movie and the book. And I run with it. And, uh, and I try to give back as much as I can. Um, I'm married. I have two little girls, uh, 10 and 12 years old. So, you know, I'm consumed with their sports, too. You know, I try to coach all their sports and be involved with them, you know, just being a dad. And, um, you know, and, and you, you guys are still young enough, um, whether you have kids or not. I mean, you remember the way your parents were and, you know, you got to support them the best you can. So uh, I'm, I'm pretty busy. You know, I, I try to just I'm always on the go. Where can people find you if they want to buy the book and the second book? Because obviously the, there was a second edition. So if you want to let people know where they can find it and where they can purchase it. You know what? The easiest place to find anything of mine would be on Amazon, amazon.com, even eBay, but Amazon's the place to go. Um, and they ship all over the world, all over the country, of course. Um, the book is an autobiography. It's not like the movie. Um, you know, the movie's basically Hollywood scripted, like we talked about earlier. It's kind of corny. It's kind of goofy. It's funny. It's a comedy. It's not as realistic as the book, of course. Uh, side note, guy, like, cut this out. But do you reckon we could run like some kind of competition with uh, with our subscribers and and listeners to like win a win a book? Oh, I'll do whatever you guys want. I'll send someone a book, an autograph. Uh, yeah, let's do you know, I, listen, I appreciate you guys hooking me up today with the interview. I love it. So uh, yeah, whatever you guys want to scheme up. How about uh, whoever can punch Nick in the face the fastest wins a free book. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I tell you I'm, what, guy, I'm, leave that I'm in. All of us. Hey, <laughs> hey, I am so, so, so ready to have a tilt with anybody. Anybody. <laughs> I don't no, no, no. You, you don't get to punch the back. We cannot get Yeah, let's Sinopoli. see how that works out. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah but, Sophie yeah. to duct tape you to the pagola. <laughs> you, guys want, <laughs> you guys want to put something put something together in your end, I'll certainly mail you out something. That's yeah, not a that's problem. Cool. We can we can stay in touch uh, like we did earlier. We can stay in touch with each other. Yeah, excellent. that'd be awesome. Really Thank you so much. Excellent. Really appreciate Is that, that. Right. There's there's two or three things we normally like to do on this podcast. We're just going to run through them real quick. Favorite player or best player teammate that you ever played with? You know, for me, I'm going to say uh, I got to play with a minor league tough guy who made it up to the NHL as a fighter. His name is Jacques Mayotte. He was Nick, nickname was the mailman. Yeah. He played with the Quebec Nordiques in the 80s, 1980s. And he, he got brought up by Quebec to play against the Boston Bruins. And he fought two guys in one night, Lyndon Byers and Cam Neely. And um, I got to play with Jacques Mayotte on a team a number of years after that. And I was just starting out. And he was the seasoned veteran type of guy who kind of took me under his wing. And, uh, you know, I'll always respect and love him for that. He, he you know, he helped me out. That kind of right, takes you care of this next, next one. I was going to say that takes care of the next one because we normally ask who's the toughest guy, but that sounds very much, <laughs> very yeah, much like pretty, that guy. He was pretty tough. He'd be in my top top group of guys who was legit badass tough guys. Mac, last question. You know what it is. No, no, I'm just looking this guy up. Sorry, I haven't even heard of him. I've got it. I'm just I've, on his elite prospects. Enough. I've got it. Right, so <laughs> our favourite one, and it's, it's the one that people tune in to hear, stories for the boys. So this can be anything. Obviously, you're a minor leaguer. You, you spent time pounding the, uh, pounding the bus lanes and in shitty changing rooms and cold showers and dog shit post-game food what's what's the kind of 
best story you got for the for the guys and well you know i mean like you said you hit the nail on the head being a minor league hockey player the life sucks um you know you're on a bus it's like a sardine can and uh, you're traveling all over the place with a bunch of guys and you're playing hockey and you're eating shitty food at a gas station when you pull over the fill up for the bus and um but i mean it's great you know you tons of girls tons of women uh you're hitting the bars you go golf during the daytime. I mean, it's a, it's a luxurious life. It's a, it's a type of life that you want to at least experience once, you know, and uh, after a couple of years, it gets old because it's like the same old, same old, the money sucks. That's the bottom line. You want more money, but um, you know, being a minor league hockey guy, believe me from where I came from, it was glorious. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Thank you so much for joining us. Like, yeah, boys, genuinely I appreciate really it too. Loved it really really appreciate it this has been awesome like we we normally put aside about an hour for interviews and this has gone on for way longer so <laughs> <laughs> you guys gotta stop yapping jamie he won't shut up over there look at him I, I let these two fucking idiots just waffle me <laughs> and just leave it the producer yeah. will cut out all the bullshit mate keep your good stuff in that's all yeah you need. but you know i mean i'm really impressed with some of the guys that you have been able to watch play like we were talking about earlier some of the former nhl guys that are over there playing in those leagues i mean you guys got to see the cream of the crop tough guys oh, it yeah. may have been at the end of their careers but they're still bad asses to fight i would never want to fight half of those guys oh well, uh, matt you tell still would the trevor robbins story because oh. that's a great story that's the other, uh, is it Robbins? I was saying, tell him the, the Robbins story, the, the guy that went the other way. Bobby, Bobby, Bobby Robbins. Robbins. Trevor Robbins. I had him in Providence. Robin. I worked oh, with him okay. in Providence. Thank okay, you. so he he was here first. Yep. And then went to the show. Correct. Is that not crazy? Yeah, he came through Providence and then went to Boston. But we, we were trying to get him in a podcast, but I th- I th- we've been looking at what his life and that he's done. He's He seems to be... He's leaning more towards God now, I think. Any, I don't know if you've had any dealings with right. him. Right. He, he, so he's had some concussion issues, and um, yeah. and he has found God. And I'm not going to say he's so much as like a preacher, but um, you know, he he just believes in God, and and that's kind of what he's into today. And so uh, I think he'll talk about hockey, but I don't think he wants to get really in depth the way say we did today. You know. Yeah, yeah. I thought that from from when we were messaging. I think it's like he's he's turned his life around, and I think he maybe wants to leave that sort of side behind. So right, I, and I and know. you know, and that's a, that's a great like uh, respectful way to put it. Yeah, yeah. I just uh, I just had a quick one. Obviously, our podcast was kind of formed on the back of Spitting Chicklets. Spitting Chicklets had on Officer Yandel quite a few times. You're a Boston guy. He's now got his own podcast. Listening to you talk tonight, is this maybe something that could be in your future, the podcast game? Because I think people would tune in to listen to you shoot the shit. I don't mind being a guest on podcasts and I don't mind talking my story. I don't think I could ever be like you guys as a host and, and have a show. Um, you know, I mean, like I said, I don't mind yapping at people. I could yap for hours. But, uh, <laughs> you know, being the, but being the guy that throws out the questions, I think I could go pretty cold fast <laughs> <laughs> just make out you're interrogating somebody in the street should be right? fine exactly. <laughs> <laughs> just like as soon as they sign on read them the uh the miranda rights yeah exactly you have the right to remain <laughs> silent <laughs> yeah okay well yeah. this is a great podcast <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> right but you guys do a great job because there's three of you you know you can feed off of each other and it makes it go by yeah, like Waddy and I chat, and Max sits there. <laughs> no, <laughs> Max, you know, but Max, uh, Max actually answers, asks, sorry, the important questions. We waffle yeah. and ask 46 questions. Max asks six, and they're the most six important questions in the whole entire podcast. So. Right, right. Yeah, we, uh, very valid. It's a balancing act. It's a balancing act. <laughs> there you go. And, and the thing is, like, like you say, you, you, you talked about... Uh, Sorry, if some if people want to check it out, the fight stories, fight stories on YouTube. Yeah, so I che- I've checked a couple of their bits out. I think it's worth our fans. If you like our podcast, you'll like their podcast for sure. It, it, it it's very similar. It's guys right. shooting the shit and having fun, and that's, that's obviously all. where I got to to see the content about Colton. Or 
let's uh, let's ask a question that we don't normally ask because we don't normally get it. Who's your favorite NHL tough guy that you have helped fight? Um, you know, they're all good guys. I mean, I've never met one guy who's a prick. They're all good guys. And they really, and like, you listen, you guys can attest to this because you've gotten to see a lot of them in, in your area. Like we just talked about a little while ago. You've met some really good NHL and American They're all the guys. best people. Yep. Right. And you see them at a bar and they'll shoot the shit with you all night because they're just regular guys. They have a job to do. They like to fight, but they have a job to do. And I mean, listen, John Scott, NHL guy, awesome guy. Colt Noor, Steve McIntyre. I can go down the list. Dennis Bond. We had we've had Big Mac on the pod like three yeah. weeks back. So I mean, they're all super good guys. They're fun to hang out with. They're fun to shoot the shit with, and they're a terror to watch on the ice because they're gonna fucking rip someone's face off. So that's enjoyable as a fan to watch. Oh, like a quick fanboy question then. So when you're doing the coaching, are you are you ho- ever holding mitts on the ice while these big boys are punching? Oh yeah, yeah, and I okay. have some YouTube. I have right, some let's YouTube go. Videos. Who punches the hardest, Big Mac or John Scott? Big Mac. I thought Big so. Mac He's owns a that title. Yeah, he, scary he, person. Yeah, I'm talking about a guy that's six six, two sixty, and lean, and he's a legitimate fucking beast. He's a big guy, heavy, heavy hands. Colton Pretty Moore. sure he was wrestling fucking bulls before he came on to speak to us on the podcast. Yeah, sure, like probably, hog, t- hog tying things and yeah he's like a cowboy yeah. in a ranch he lives in a ranch and he like he wrestles steer he's a madman whatever yeah, <laughs> yeah dogs out <laughs> yeah i'm not wrestling steers it's been absolutely awesome having you on thank you so much yeah Andy, um, i appreciate it and guys you were you were great loved it boys yeah well well on on that note like we'll we'll let you go i feel like there's there's more to talk about so there might be a second episode maybe a third or a fourth yep if you if if you're uh if your audience wants more bullshit out of my mouth beam me up (laughs) oh they're gonna love it thanks for watching don't forget to check out our previous podcast guest theo fleury and look out for the boys from on the bench coming soon Head over to manscaped.com, use 4K20 for 20% off the lawnmower 3.0.